Hi, guys. Welcome to this episode of The Trainer Feed. We are your hosts. My name is Angel Sanchez. We have DB, David Bravo. Hello. And we have JD, Jacques Delage. What's going on, everybody? I was in for another episode. <laughs> we, got a, we got a guest on today. It's Jacques' boy. So, Jacques, you want to intro? Yeah. So, um, I, me and uh, Renzo, Renzo Romero, uh, I've been following each other on Instagram for a little while. He's based out in um, California. And he's been following us. He's been following our page. Been following our, our podcast for a little while. And uh, I know he recently ventured uh, onto completely doing his own thing. So I felt he'd be a great guy to to get on, uh, pick his brain. He's also um, uh, not originally from the states. I uh, mean, him. We spoke about having like a like mindset coming to the states as um, emigrating over. And he's he's a cool dude. So I'm excited to have him on and to pick his brain. So yeah, we'll bring him on. Well, sounds good. Want to enter him in now? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome. Hey, Renzo. What's up? How's it going? Hey, how you doing? Good. How are you? Good. How are you guys? Good, man. Caught him with a leg. Yeah, Renzo. So this is Angel. This is David. These are the co-hosts. I spoke to you about great guys. And Angel, David, this is Renzo. As I mentioned, we did jump on a call briefly the other day, but um, thank you so much for taking the time. I know based on the conversation you had, you have like a lot going on right now, right? Like you have things left, right, in every direction. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've been, again, following you guys for a little while and, and, and following the, uh, the uh, trainer feed Instagram since you guys kind of started it. So I feel really uh, honored that you guys wanted to have me in the in the call thanks for following us as well we appreciate that no yeah yeah thank you uh so i know originally you're from peru right and yes. you came over i want to say it was 13 to 15 years ago uh, something like that yeah 13. something like that right yeah and then tell us for our listeners who aren't familiar with you how like and we're going over here to the states and then how you end up finding yourself into training how how did that come about I yeah, I feel like for most, uh, you know, trainers, uh, just growing up, we were introduced to some type of uh, sport, or we were just into fitness from a young age. And uh, for me, uh, I grew up playing uh, competitive tennis, uh, did a bit of martial arts here and there as well. And uh, in Peru, soccer or football is it's a huge thing. So I grew call up football, we'll call yeah. football. <laughs> yeah uh i know more most of the listeners are probably from from the state so likely uh, yeah uh but yeah so i grew up you know playing sports and uh it wasn't until i got injured playing football that i needed to uh start doing rehab and stuff like that and i had a, a physical therapist slash trainer who introduced me to like just resistance training and recovery and all that stuff. And then that's uh, along the, the time where I started playing tennis, tennis competitively in Peru. And so that was kind of like the intro to the importance of training, you know, for me before that was just playing the sports, like just as much as I can. And then I noticed how my, my skills just improved because of training and uh that just kind of carried on. And then moving to the States, uh, I didn't speak the language. Um, I didn't really have any friends. It was getting used to the, the culture and, and, and learning the language and just kind of like that survival mode where uh, just the gym was like the place where I would go to to spend most of my time. And uh, that's really kind of how fitness was a part of my life always. And uh, just, you know, uh, just throughout school and, and, and life, that's, that was the one constant thing. And slowly, most people, I feel like, start this way. You know, friends and family, you want to learn and then you start practicing with them. And then, you know, I just realized that this just just like fitness and sports is just the one constant thing and, and, and something that I'm passionate about. Uh so I, I, I do feel lucky to say that I do what I love for a living. I know a lot of people, it's uh, whether you do something that gives you money or something that you love and doesn't give you money, but finding that in between is really hard. So, uh, you know, I do, I do feel really lucky that I found that. Uh, and, and I'm just, you know, this is it. This is, this is what I'm passionate about. So anything, anything new and learning more about the field is just exciting, you know? 
So to say, kinda... sorry, go on, sorry. No, go, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. But I didn't know that he didn't speak the language when he came over. That's oh, really yeah. something. That was a, that was a struggle, but it was. I think that's the the main and only way to really learn a language is just to just dive in into into that and, end, and yeah, I, yeah, I had to survive somehow. So like movies books that was like the main thing nice. and uh, you know I was really quiet the first couple of years because I couldn't communicate so I would just listen and try to understand and uh, and yeah I, I mean it was just that survival instinct that made me just learn it that's something I think so I'm drawing a comparison when I came over it was more like seven eight years ago but I spoke English right and I found it difficult I thought there was a lot of cultural differences so the fact that you were starting from scratch I found it really difficult. So to imagine not, I just, I can, I have so much, so much, like so much kudos credit to you because that's okay. not easy. Um, and then to now to be so fluent, like it, it takes time, right? But I think as what you're saying, people that I spoke to when they've gone abroad, they've, they've dove in the deep end. And the movies is a really interesting thing because I had coworkers that were, uh, if they were Portuguese or Spanish and they came to the UK, they watch all the movies. But what was funny was their accents when they spoke English was American, even though they live in the UK. Oh, so that was kind of funny because you're like, wait, why are you got like a Portuguese American accent? Right. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah. in England, so it's kind of funny. But I did want to go over. So you are you are with Equinox. You since left. You're doing. You're on your own. Like, tell us about how that's going. What you see the vision of that going to? Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's uh there's just so much so much to say about that um and uh from what i know you guys are all still part of the company uh right and uh i i just i have learned so much from that experience and i was with the company for about three years i think um uh, you know like there, it, it just uh yeah, I, learned, I gained so much experience from them. Uh, you know, my training prior to that was, you know, I, I was still uh, looking for what's new in, in the field. You know, one of my very first, like, I would say, like, out there, like, certifications was an animal flow before joining Equinox. Uh, I was always looking for what's new or what will expand my, my training style. Uh, I was part of the Equinox Academy. I was doing a lot of stuff with Equinox before I worked for the company and, you know, doing certifications at an Equinox and stuff like that. So uh, just, uh, I, it was just like, I need to be a part of this. I, I was telling Jock that, did I pronounce your name correctly? Jock? Ja Jack, yeah, Jack or Jock. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Okay. It's, ja it's Jackie's. Uh, don't Jackie. listen to him. Don't listen to him. No, don't Jackie listen. Chan. Jackie Chan. Listen to either of those. Jackie's. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I saw that, I saw that X, man. I saw that Lululemon shirt with the X and I wanted it. That's, that's what I wanted. I, I saw their private office and I was like, I need, that's what. <laughs> and so, um, I was, you know, doing my own training and, and then I just decided like, you know, I will, yeah, I just really wanted to work with the company. And, and, uh, you know, when I interviewed, that was like what I said, I was like, I want to be a TRX trainer. And so, uh, you know, I started working with the company and I, I moved up tiers fairly fast, I think up to tier three, the tier, the, the, the plus took me a little bit longer, uh, but I moved fairly fast. I was just hungry to like, just grow. And, you know, I think that going into that company, um, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of turnover, you know, and, and, and there's people that think that you come in and, and you just get all the clients and then you make all the money. But uh, if you go into it, knowing what it takes and you go into it, knowing like all the tools that they will provide for you and you're hungry to grow uh, and you can take advantage of that, I think is very beneficial. And luckily I, I knew that. So I went in just, just doing everything, just like, you know, it, talking to everyone and, and learning from all the other trainers. I was lucky that when I started, I was uh, invited to different Equinox events. So I got to meet tier uh, trainers that were tier three plus from different locations. Uh, and so I would just ask them all the questions. Uh, and so through that, just like taking advantage of like EFTI and like all the certifications that I could take through that, my training just kind of like, or, or my knowledge just also grew like in a short period of time and and so i was just like on the journey to trx 
And uh, as I was telling you, you know, with, with uh, the pandemic, everything shut down. So I was about to start the, uh, the curriculum to tier X, the, the, the gym shut down. So then I had to kind of, uh, when they reopened, I had to restart the whole process. Right. So then that was just, a uh, you know, it was a lot when it was, a, it was, it was not an easy decision, but it, it felt like the right thing to do. So, um, so it kind of just gave me the space to, uh, it, to just, you know, grow on my own. And, and, and so it's been recent, but things have been kind of falling into place and uh, just gaining the experience from a place with those standards just really puts you, I think, on a different uh, level than, than, than other, other trainers. What are some of your certs? Like, what, what have you specialized in so far? Uh, I have, well, I mentioned the animal flow, uh, precision nutrition, uh, stick mobility, kettlebell athletics, um, level two, um, pain-free performance specialist, uh, which is a great one. I highly recommend, uh, you, or if you haven't heard of that one, I highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. And, then, um, I feel like I'm missing something. I, I one of the big ones that I want to dive into is, uh, anatomy trains and I did an intro to it and it was it just kind of changed a lot for me just from the intro alone. So the course is, is longer, but uh, that's, that's it. It must be something. And yeah, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. I wanted to know about the stick mobility one. So yeah. I've seen a lot of ads about it or, you know, a lot of brochures on it, but I wasn't sure. And then people were like, Oh no, nah, you don't want to do that. Cause it's like stretching. I was like, well, stretching is really important. And then some people were like, yeah, but you're going to pay like $300 for a stick. And then I was like, but I don't have, I can't do that with a broom. So can you right. tell me a little bit about that? Just from a personal note. And then we could talk yeah, about yeah. everything else. I want to know a little bit about that one. I've never, I've never heard those comments about stick mobility, uh, but we got they, savages in our club. That's I've why. Heard, I've heard worse, <laughs> I've heard worse things. And it's that, funny yeah. because uh, I had other trainers. It's just, it's you know there's so many things to say about this but i've had other trainers make fun of me because i would do animal flow with some clients and some uh and myself and and those trainers would be like the trainers that mainly belong to like a golf gym or something like that and so uh in my opinion the more diverse you are firing <laughs> those that. shots let's go i don't i'm just saying like in my opinion, the more diverse you are and the more you understand, even if you don't use it, the more you understand, uh, the better you'll be able to adapt to each client. You know, like mm -hmm. you, there's so many clients that just like, you know, they're, they're so picky or, or, or hard to please. And, and the more tools in your toolbox, and there's something, you know, we all learn is like the more you can, the, 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 the better you can customize everything for them. So uh, with the sticks, to be honest, it's one of the best certs that I've done. Uh, it's not only about stretching. The sticks is, is very hand in hand with uh, FRC. And I know that uh, Angel, right? Yeah. You're FRC certified. So I think that you would love it a lot. And, and, and the sticks uh, focuses a lot on, on uh, fascia lines and, and mm -hmm. lengthening and strengthening fascia lines. Uh, strengthening and, and joint health as well as uh, there's a lot of uh, pails and rails in, in, uh, with the sticks, uh, a lot of isometric stuff. Um, it's really, yeah, like I said, it's, 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 a, it's a very useful tool and, and stuff that you can't do with a broomstick or, or uh, anything else because the sticks are, are made, they're, they've been inspired from uh, bamboo, so they can really like bend uh, again, you can do so many, uh, so many things other than just passive stretching. Uh, I use it a lot for warmups and again, strengthening stuff with isometric holds that gets really intense. You can do a whole workout with just that, you know, uh, and, and uh, recruit as much muscles as, as uh, muscle fiber. I mean, as, as doing like some heavy uh, strength training. Uh, it's nice to mix it in with everything else, but I think that. I, I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, if you look, if you look in their page and in their Instagram or, or, or if you follow them, there's a lot of like power lifters that use it. Uh, you know, I, I think it's very useful. I, I've had very good experience with it and it's expanded my training and my clients training uh, a lot. Uh, 
I highly, highly recommend it. Even if you just do the cert and don't use them and just have the sticks with you, like I use them every day uh, and uh, it's improved my, I, I do rock climbing. And so the sticks have really helped me improve with my sport. I'm always, you know, like this is the new sport that I'm obsessed with and I climb as much as I can. It just requires so much like mobility, strength and different things that, this is yeah like grip strength and this is uh uh one of the reasons also why i found the sticks so uh i was just so interested on the sticks because one of the the founders of the sticks he he climbs a lot so i noticed how that was so uh at least for myself it's just been so useful but i i highly recommend this sorry if i said something that upset you guys but um <laughs> no not at all no, nothing the, at all the whole thing about me made fun of i completely relate because for so many years they joked about me being an oh, kettlebell master just because all I did once I got my cert was kettlebells. Like, oh, kettlebell. And they put the English accent, oh, kettlebell master. And it was just, oh, it's all dual, I did. Want some dual kettlebell swings? Dual kettlebell swings. Like, what do you mean dual? I was like, but, dual, double, you know, like whatever. Double like, kettlebell swings. Right? But, dual means know, toes. Latin for two, right? Like he got, there was an email sent like on a newsletter from Roan and they called him a kettlebell master. They put they actually, Jack Delegere, kettle, kettlebell master. Don't act master, like you so. don't know, Jacques. Yeah, and I sent it. I screenshotted <laughs> it and I sent it to everybody <laughs> um, but it's funny because people did make fun of you that is true but yeah. now so I, you, know, I, you got brands coming out there and putting you in the yeah. newsletter and that's your title right there you go uh, so you gotta, the point you gotta own it I, I you want to own it yes i think that when at least for myself when i do a new cert i just obsess over it just to learn as much as i can, as you can yeah exactly when i got when i did the sticks for the whole first two to three week weeks i was just doing every like day sticks. And I, I'm just going to tell you where from doing the, the cert after that weekend, like all my, jo- like my hips and my shoulders were super sore. Uh, mm. I was shocked that I was so sore from the sticks. I, I highly recommend it. Highly from recommend. not loading your body with an external weight, right? Did it was, you go on? Sorry. Go no, I was going to say it's those pills and rails, man. Yeah. FRC. They talk a lot about that and they, they used it in the course that we took. We did it virtually but they kind of like just pulled it out as opposed to like saying, oh, these are the mobility sticks. And he just yeah. pulled it out from the studio. Like he was like, oh, and I'm going to use this for my hip cars. And I was like, damn, yeah. I need something like that. So I ended up using like, you know, a wall, but that would probably be the more optimal tool for it. Cause it bends like you were saying, Renzo. Yeah. I think that you, uh, based on what you're saying, based on what I've seen that uh, of the stuff that you do, I think you would enjoy it a lot. I think it will be okay very beneficial all right guys so be on the lookout for that one um, yeah. but yeah oh, no yeah. thank and you there's for- a thing there's a thing usually when when we're at at the at the club and there's a new cert coming out we all get the emails right it's like oh this new cert's coming out we always do the thing where okay the, the weekend after the cert you know hide the vipers <laughs> everybody's gonna start using all the vipers gonna start using all yeah. the kettlebells yeah yeah you gotta practice you gotta practice it yeah. um but i also wanted to touch on another point that you brought up that was really good about getting those certifications and some some of them you just don't touch them for a while but catering to the clients that uh, might be difficult or might not know how to articulate what they exactly want so i've had that happen and i've had that experience before where i did get you know obviously you know the viper certification when you first start it's like the lowest hanging fruit everybody jumps on that one but i didn't really use it for that many clients for like one year two years three years four years And then when I was tier three plus, there was a client that came through and she was explaining how she wanted to kind of um, lengthen and uh, have something with resistance, but feel stronger with resistance. And for me, it was difficult for me to kind of put the pieces together. Like, what does she want? Right. Like, what do you mean lengthen? Do you mean stretching? And she was like, no, not stretching. Do you mean, you know, uh, doing things at longer levers like creating longer levers and like manipulating force that way and she was like i don't know what that means so i was like all right here's the tool bam viper and we started doing some viper flows and it really worked and she loved it and she said this was the best thing and nobody's ever done that and it became like a referral to another referral so just having that library there because sometimes you might not uh, have the tools at your disposal or might not have um, as much experience if you don't put yourself out there and try to you know, learn something different, something that's outside of your wheelhouse, but it comes in and it becomes beneficial and it pays itself. It pays for itself. Oh, for sure. And it it also like separates you from the rest when you have that secret tool that, you know, like you 
mentioned with that client, it's like they, she's never, she probably didn't even know what a Viper was. And you just open up this whole new world in her fitness journey. And that's what's exciting, you know, like just like using different tools and then you see how that improves a person's life or, you know, because yeah, that's the whole goal. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to touch on was just the business aspect, because I know that you're entering this world and now you're starting your own thing. Um, do you have a preference for virtual or in person? And if you were to say, this is my ideal situation uh, where I'm doing X percent in virtual and X percent in person, do you find like there is that benefit? Because you're in California, correct? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles. So it might be a little bit difficult to kind of like get from point A to point B sometimes, I'm assuming if you're driving from place to place, or if you're just kind of like stationed out in one spot, I guess it's a little bit easier, but you know, uh, do you do virtuals? Have you had experience with that? And what's the, what's that been like? Yeah, I, I do virtuals currently. Uh, I was doing a bit more virtuals during the, the height of the pandemic. Uh, but I think that both have, you know, the, their good stuff and their bad stuff, like with pride with in-person, it's just that driving around, especially in LA, just stuck in traffic, uh, whether you are going to a private gym, whether you're going to some, uh, a client's house who has a gym, or maybe some clients don't have any equipment. So it's like carrying the equipment, uh, driving around. Uh, so yeah, in that sense, virtual is nice because you're just at home. Uh, however, for me, I, I prefer in person just because uh, I don't know if you guys um, I don't know if you guys have done virtual during the pandemic. Uh, I think that it's been great because it really improved your your uh, just your your coaching. You know, your queuing and, and being able to to put a, a client through a session when you're not there in person. Uh, I think that for trainers that our trainers now and have been trainers during this whole pandemic. It's been, it's been, it's been a good thing. It's been great because it's just really pushed you uh, outside of your comfort zone, outside of your like being at the gym and people come to you. Uh, but I like, I prefer in person because uh, I just like being there. I like, I, it's much uh, more personable, uh, just, better when it comes to noticing things that you might have not noticed or you know there's clients that you need to just just you know help them uh rather than just telling them uh just you know i have clients that i'll i'll, I'll virtually i'll, I'll um, you know i'll say something and, and it's like they hear me but it's not it's not they're not doing it you know and i keep repeating it or I find different ways of saying it and it's not changing. So in person, you're able to grab a tool and put it somewhere that will help them kind of like understand what you're saying. Um, and just getting out of the house. I mean, I feel like just, yeah, um, the idea of, of doing everything virtually and you can do it from a beach is amazing. But getting out of the house and going to a gym, seeing being around other trainers, it's, it's, it's I like that a lot. It just puts, it keeps you on that, on that mindset. Uh, it's easy. It, it's, it's, uh, it's not, I enjoy a lot being around other trainers and, and just kind of talking about uh, just the trainer life, you know, and, and when you're at home, it's a bit lonely. That is true. Uh, yeah. There are so many times where I just find myself staring at a wall in between yeah. sessions. And I'm just like, yeah. so how yeah. are we doing today? And the wall obviously <laughs> does not respond back. No, but um, when I, have because of virtuals, it's had like an impact on me where uh, when I do in-person stuff, I'm thinking more creatively about how I can optimize on those in um, on those in-person sessions. And when I'm outside, I'm just thinking more about um, can I do something more sports specific? Can I do something where we use more space? Can I do something where we really take advantage of me being able to see you from different angles? And I didn't really have that perspective prior to this whole pandemic because you know I didn't do virtuals at all. Um, but now I'm kind of saying, all right, we're going to, I'm going to bring a tennis ball, some cones, we're going to do some drills, you know, I'm going to have you do walking lunges as opposed to like, you know, alternating forward lunges or something like that in one spot, right. You know, um, trying to diversify it a little bit more. So I would, I just wanted to see what your take on it was, cause I've been experimenting with it a little bit more now. And obviously just realizing that this whole thing is unpredictable. So we don't know which way the wind is going to blow tomorrow but trying to optimize on what we have in front of us right now with the perspective and the knowledge from, you know, last year. 
yeah no it's it's it yeah you got to be prepared for anything but uh yeah i agree with you i think that for me it would be 80 percent in person 20 percent virtual something like that so it's, sometimes it's nice to just like stay home and not have to drive around have you have you had more people prefer virtual now especially with all the crap going on right now or the <laughs> the, the resurgence of uh of covid at uh, the beginning, yes, like everyone was super open and, and it was a learning curve for everyone, you know, like it was having to adapt. And I'm sure you guys went through the same thing, like having to adapt to every like, you know, when you have clients that are committed, which is awesome, you know, the, the their their results or fitness their health is a priority. So they just want to make it happen. Uh, and, you know, uh, just just having to adapt and it's like, well, you know, get this type of equipment so you can have at least a couple of things. So then that challenges you as a trainer to program with like a dumbbell and bands or like a TRX and a couple of bands. And then you have to do a whole three, you know, uh, like three times a week or with that and, and keep things fresh and keep people getting results. So that, that was great as a challenge. Uh, and you can only take that so far, you know? And so then it's like, well, get this other piece of equipment uh, and so people are open for that, but once things, the restrictions started to, uh, relax a little bit, I've had a couple, uh, cl virtual clients that I'll, I train like three times a week where they want to train one of those times in person. So slowly start. And, uh, and I like that as well. It was like, okay, it's nice. Well, it, it helped, uh, just kind of progress the, the program and, and, uh, you know, just, you know what you're doing at home. And then when we're together, we're, we're doing this. So um, yeah, that's kind of how it's been. Okay. How, how would you program for somebody that let's say, cause you said you do martial arts as well. I, um, I did when I was younger, okay. I haven't in years, uh, yeah. but I have some, yeah, no, go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. no, I, I mean, I was just asking if somebody does want to do that or, or for example, in your tennis background, do you have anybody that wants to do something based on that? And you've had to maybe go, you know, change completely the way you were training them because now it's virtual. Like I, I would assume it's hard to train somebody for tennis virtually, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it definitely is. But I think that the best way, uh, luckily for me, the I have a couple of clients that do play tennis and we were training in person. But I think that what I would have done uh, is just breaking down and doing what we can with what we have. Mm. Uh, so obviously, you know, there's a lot of athletic uh, drills to do when you're training someone who plays tennis, but at the same time, there's other drills that you have to like, like rotational power and just strengthening those things that you can do uh, without like running around or using cones or agility ladders or anything like that. So that's when like, you just get creative and you focus on what you can. And it's like, all right, you're at home this is what you have available we can kind of shift the program towards just strengthening all these rotational things like you know just when it comes to stretching or joint health and like all these things really come into play with martial arts and like other sports you know like just all the like I said joint health and and, and uh, rotational stuff I think when I when I think of those two sports those are two main things that I think about so I think that uh, you can do some of that stuff at home you just got to get creative and see what you have available you know like you can definitely make that work with like some bands and, and and some dumbbells for sure yeah uh in terms of like sports specific training i think it's hard especially when you're training at home to be training something for a sport because yeah. for example power i mean how, how would how would somebody train for power if, it, if they don't have like i guess heavy weights right right or, I, or moderate to heavy weight i yeah i think that uh, isometrics would, would be a very useful thing in that, uh, that's just one of the main things that pops into my, my head and, right now. Yeah. And plyos too. I've been doing mm -hmm. some yeah. research on how, uh, plyometric training can help maintain, you know, muscle mass and also like power output, even without resistance or added resistance, but you can grab some ankle weights or right. a weighted vest and do some jumps and hops and still maintain right. that. Yeah. hundred percent. But, um, but yeah, go ahead, Jack. Oh, I was going to say it was, um, when it comes to coaching virtually and in person, I don't know your animal certified. I know you mentioned earlier about the Sigma ability being sore for two, three days from one of the exercises, but so I, I can relate that too. And I was thinking about how 
oh, how would I be so sore from not having external loads to work with? And I guess what I'm alluding to is when it comes to training, how have you gone about coaching animal flow patterns that the client isn't familiar with? Because if they're familiar with a crab reach, and even if they're not familiar with a crab reach, crab reach is somewhat one of the less complicated ones to walk a client through. But if it's something such as a front kick through or a side kick through, how, how have you gone about that? How have you had those, uh, those experiences? How's that gone? Oh, you mean virtually or in person? Yeah, because if you're doing it, I feel like if you're doing it in person, you can you can say, oh, like walk you through it. This is how it's going to look. And then you can reassure, not reassure, uh, reaffirm the pattern by doing it with them. But if it's virtually, mm-hmm. uh, how has that gone? Because I know I've had some difficulties where you mentioned the client coming in to see you once a week and then in the other second time or third time virtually. Mm-hmm. I've kept some of those patterns to the in-person sessions. Whereas once you've done it, then I'll do it in virtually. But like, what does that look like for you? I'm just curious as uh, being that you've done the animal flow certification. Yeah, I can think of one client actually that he was out of town um, and he had minimal equipment. So I threw in some animal flow drills and uh, just like showing it myself and then just walking him through uh, just again, the more basic movements uh, like a sidekick through. Um, and really uh, just repetition and really like just walking him through. And, and, and it also requires like, you know, some clients will make it easier for you. Some clients will make it a bit more challenging because there's some clients that are patient and they're like, I know that you're trying to get somewhere with what you're having me do. So yes, I'll listen and I'll slow down and I will fix it. Because uh, sometimes I'll be picky, especially when it, when it comes to animal flow, you know, have your hand here, elbow here, this, this yeah. and point the toe. And then you have to say it a bunch of times, like point that toe, point that toe. And, uh, and so luckily this client was patient. And, and so we either slow down and then we change the tempo of things with animal flow and uh, he enjoyed it. He got a great workout out of it. And then, you, like you mentioned, like getting sore out of stuff like that. It's like changing the tempo is a huge thing that yeah. will make things a lot more challenging, you know? So I used that with the animal flow drills that I was doing, just slowing things down, then making things a lot faster, you know, mm. especially with a, with a side kick through, you know, we can do like six reps back and forth of really slow and controlled. And then the next six, just as, as, as explosive. Oh, that's and, a good way of putting it. Yeah. Good way of mixing and, it up. And so repetition, and then the next virtual session, we do something similar, a crab reach or, or, you know, a, a front kick through or something like that. And then, um, yeah, that, I think that, just you know the the tempo would just clean up the the drill and uh and just asking your client for patience like i'm getting i'm going somewhere with this just bear with me and if you hate it too much fine but at least give it a try you know i have a client that always asks me does it really matter i'm like yes like fuck (laughs) come on get it done yeah it also goes to yeah it also goes to like people saying um uh, and we're going to see that what you just spoke about the kick through slow and then fast on Jacques, uh, on Jacques Instagram. I'm gonna make so it just give it, give it a week. <laughs> He's going to do like six slow. He's going to like tempo so all caps. Like give me uh, some credit on that. Oh, I would. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'd give right. you credit. Don't worry. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is like, how do you handle, because I've had this experience before and I handle it one way, but like, how do you handle some uh, clients who have like negative or self doubt um, and they express it verbally to you when you're like training, for example, you have them do, a squat or uh, the the movement pattern you were just speaking about the kick through and they're just saying, I can't, I can't. And you know that they have the potential to do it. You know, they have the cognitive ability, you know, that they have, you know, the movement capacity, um, but they're always just doubting themselves and saying, I can't, or this is stupid, or I'm so stupid. Like people just, I have a couple of clients that do that and I handle it one way, but I want to see what your take on it is like clients speaking negatively to themselves about movement. Yeah, I think that's such a huge thing. I think that part of, uh, you know, getting certified to be a trainer or, or a certification, and, and I don't know if there is one, it's like just more focus on psychology, you know, it's such a big part of training people. Uh, there's some clients that you just, they just want to talk to you for an hour and, and, and vent, you know, uh, I don't probably you guys I'm sure have experienced that. And, and yeah, there's so much negative talk and, and I've experienced this so many times with different clients that are recovering from an injury and, and, and an injury is such a psychological thing, you know, like we go through the steps 
can we fix and and and, and, and I've worked hand in hand with uh, different PTs and I love doing that because you team up and you fix the client a lot faster. But you know, based on everything, the person is ready to progress. But mentally, they're still in that injury. So, and, and that also goes with like the negative talk of, of, of people just like getting so frustrated. I have a, one client that comes to mind that he, if he doesn't do it perfect, every single rep at the end of the exercise, he's just like, oh, I'm like, he just, it stays with him. We were, we've moved on to like, towards the end of the session, he's still thinking about that one rep that he would like a couple of reps that he wasn't perfect mm -hmm. at. And that just obviously dives into some deeper stuff that you know people go through but i think that you know patience understanding and being caring like just really genuinely caring for the person uh there's just so many different styles of training there's just so many different uh trainers out there that you know it, it, you just really have to be able to understand the person who they are as a person uh, how they kind of think and, and how they feel, what triggers them, what doesn't, and how to talk to them, you know, like just build rapport with them. It's just so important so that when you hit those, those moments of like, they just like really frustrated with themselves, just knowing how to get them out of there with, uh, again, everyone's different. So it's not like one phrase will work for everyone. I think that the main thing is just, just understanding that specific person through, you know, we just talk throughout sessions, you know, I think that the first five sessions with a new client is like not only getting to know how their body moves and their weaknesses and, and imbalances and all, all that stuff, but also how they think, how they behave, what kind of person they are. So then as you progress, you know what drives them, you know what frustrates them, you know how to get them out of that and how to empower them a little bit better. And, you know, we are trainers. So like, that's a huge thing because like physiology will change your mood, you know? So you uh, can use that to your advantage and get someone out of that shitty mood. And, and I'm sure you guys have heard it so many times that a client comes to you at the beginning of the session and they feel like crap. And then at the end of the session, they feel amazing. And they're like, oh, I'm so happy I didn't want to come today, but I'm so happy I did. I'm so happy I trained and I feel amazing. So that's just the physiology and changing that in and just makes them feel better. So, uh, just when it comes to, you know, a client doing a move or a drill that they're having a hard time uh, with that drill, it's like just being able to explain to them where they're at, what we need to fix and, and where we're going for and how it's good that they're struggling with that exercise and use yourself as an example of some stuff that you struggle with and now you're good at and how that's part of the process. And you need to go through that Uh what's it called cognitive uh phase of that exercise to really understand it and repetition and you solidify it and then making sure that a month later two month, months later you're doing that drill again and you remind them like hey remember when you were doing this two months ago and what you were saying and look at you now and then some people don't even notice that and they're like oh you're, you're right and then i really when that happens and that's happened a, a, a good amount of times i really stay there and i'm like I really want, like, remember what you were saying? And then they'll laugh and then, you know, so I think it's just like understanding the person being patient and like uh, being able to build that rapport and, and really knowing how to get them out of there. I liked how you mentioned the first five or so sessions that you're not only understanding or highlighting, identifying weaknesses and areas of opportunity, but the personality, knowing how they tick. It's a really funny thing. Whenever I start with a new client, I don't know if anyone else gets this, but I have that transition phase where I'm not quite comfortable with them yet because I don't know how they're how they work, how they tick. And once you get past maybe that five to ten session period, and it's already been two months, that you know what that session is, you know what their their stress levels are like, you know what their work uh, levels are, their demand, demand on family if they have kids, what their what their all these habits, if you will, you know how how it influences them, how they come into the session, how you mentioned with homework, how some just won't come in and do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and then after two months, it's not that you can't change someone, but you know, after two months, this is either never going to change, or this is going to take a lot more time for it to change. And you can't, you are learning about that with a person. And then going back to the point you made about knowing someone's weaknesses, you, your programming get becomes so much more concise with a person we always have a 
set of seven patterns we're basing the, the walkout with, with with pretty much every client. But then once you get to walk with them, you feel that, okay, this person, whether it's a shoulder impingement, so the, the upper body training is more mobility and the lower body is more of the, of the, of the loading or whatever it is. But I'm so glad you, you mentioned that because it's, it's probably not something that the textbooks prepare you for or the certifications may delve into, but when you're learning to become a trainer in certifications, there's maybe not enough, or maybe there's not enough that we know about. It's not, it's obviously not well known enough for all of us or for the whole training industry to be aware of before you go into training is, is, is working with the personalities or working with the, the emotional side of training, yeah. right? Whether it's the demand of how training is on their body, whether it's the, the, the personalities, but all walks of life. And uh, it's, I'm really interested. I'm really glad you mentioned that the whole, the psychological part, because you said some people, they just want, they want to talk to someone sometimes. Right. And sometimes you have to make them do the movement because you could be there all day. Yeah. That's uh, some experiences. I'm sure you've had as, as well as, as us three, you know, that kind of, you've been affects nature. Olympians. It's crazy. Like mental yeah. health. With, I was just like, watching. A documentary. It's insane. Yeah, I was watching a documentary on that last night on HBO uh, narrated by Michael Phelps and how so many Olympian, Olympians commit suicide because of the post-Olympic depression that we don't know about. Mm-hmm. And uh, I forget the name, but look it up on HBO. It's really, it's, it's just interesting. I mean, you could imagine it, right? I mean, you're yeah. like the, at the top of your game. You're like the elite of the elite. And then you get second place and you get people that yeah. are like, oh, well, you didn't win. Or it's also, like, well, I got second place. And I'm like, no, you didn't get yeah. gold. It's also like training four years every single day of their lives for this one day, and then the, they win. And then, you know, there's some stuff going after that, but after then it's like, what, do, what do I do now? You know, like, mm, there's, besides, yeah, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, there's a couple of people who I know, uh, and some one or two of them are my clients that work with athletes and specialize in, um, helping them grow from their, you know, retirement of their mm-hmm. sport because sometimes they just do the sport and they've been doing it all their lives. And then after they get all the accolades or whatever accolades they were going to collect for their career and that stops, then they just don't have anything that they feel like is worth living for because for their whole life, they've been striving for the gold and to be on the pedestal and to have those post-game interviews. Like people don't do post-game interviews for regular people, right? Nobody's asking you, so how was your day today? What did you do today? What could you have done better in this situation? Like that doesn't happen. And all that just stops. And then after that stops, it's like, you know, it's hard on the psyche for people to um, try to grow from there. So it is a grow. I think it's a growing field and we're going to learn a lot more and hopefully, you know, part of it is just societal. I think a huge part of it is how much pressure we place on them just by watching the news feeds, refreshing them, tagging them on things, you know, it's a double-edged sword, right? Yeah, hundred percent. There's also uh, picking back off that real quick. There was a some com- I think it was a comedian when you're talking about oh, every time they do a sport, uh, sorry, every time they compete, they do it press match conference, but they don't do it after a normal day of work. Someone was comparing the athletes, when like oh, they always seem so somber or disinterested. And someone said, well, you imagine every time after your nine to five job, you coming home and giving reports as to how the day day went you'd pretty much give the same sort of feedback, like, oh, this is okay. This coming better. You know, and it was like, when you think about it, I was like, yeah, that's kind of, I mean, no one would be interested, but yeah. if you came home every single day from nine to five job, like, yeah, that's what, well, started off quite well. And then at 12 o'clock kind of fell apart. Like that's kind of what it would sound like. And it's kind of crazy to think that, yeah, that would be really weird. But that's when you paint the picture, you start to think, because we, we criticize athletes um, in that respect, or at least there's been criticism for that in that realm of the sport and it, when you think about it in the nine-to-five job you you do think oh yeah that would be a little bit weird but there's also when you mentioned that hbo um uh documentary Renzo, there's another one that's worth watching on the same topic with naomi osaka on netflix and have you seen that one i haven't but i want to yeah i started watching it and it's it's really eye-opening because she obviously came out of the french open i think it was when it was what two months ago about or maybe almost three now which pulled out mm-hmm. and I heard mixed opinions on, but it, again, it's similar to someone with the mental health aspect where it's just something she's always struggled with. And what, I mean, it's without spoiling it, you'd get a good feed into her personality. 
and it just helps you paint more of the picture and understand that again there's arguments on both sides but um it, it's 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 really eye-opening and and to go from i think with her without like spoiling and you obviously you're familiar with tennis you're familiar with naomi osaka but for those who don't know how before that u.s open she won when she beat serena in the final I, I i've never heard of her never heard of her in that tournament before and it's only after the u.s open do i know who that name is when i see the draws when i see the Wimbledon's, the australian opens I, I see her name and she's a high seat and that's i think what she said was something that pressure changes you go yeah. from not being known to not only just winning but beating a u.s favorite at the open um yeah. in in that in that style as well that was one hell of a final but um yeah it just it's really eye-opening but yeah yeah it's a lot i think that uh that's i, don't, I mean now that we're talking about athletes i think that that's that aspect just the mindset is just as important as like just the training itself and just you know like just just a regular us you know sometimes like we're busy with uh have a busy schedule with clients and the only times we can train at is like 5 a.m or 4 or whatever or, or at night and at that point you really don't want to train so no nope. no imagine like you know a, a, an olympian like what they have to go through so that that's that's huge there was um uh breakdowns of what michael phelps's daily calorie intake i think at one point he was training it was like eight thousand calories or something and then you you're obviously familiar with nadal i remember reading and this is probably in the mid 2000s or early 2010s and they broke down his off-season schedule and it was something along the lines of four hours eight hour days where it was four hours in the gym four hours on the court something crazy and i mean you say four hours in the gym, but we all know his personality, his intensity. So four hours on the court in the gym isn't just two hours of mobility. Whereas I'm sure it's a good amount of time to do mobility if you're moving all day, but eight hours a day, and it's not intense. It's really intense. I mean, That's you a see lot. It, it is, That's but it's a lot. But tennis is interesting, right, Renzo? Where even though you have that month off technically in December, the players are all really getting ready for the next season, aren't they? Yeah. They're yeah. all so time off is not uh i don't know it's not a long lasting thing in the tennis world and you travel so much right when you go to it's a lot it's i feel like there's so much that we don't know you know yeah. so it's hard it's i try not to make any judgments so it's like i don't live that life and and athletes make decisions that from the outside might seem you know weird but we don't know we we're not you know live in their life so we don't know what's going through their head and everything that they have to go through up until that point so um you just got to be a bit more understanding of that but just the the finding i'm think finding that balance for them is just so important you know so yeah it's intense it's that time zone change that climate change uh time zone change different foods you're like you're constantly traveling there was a really interesting uh i think songa the french guy was asked about doping in the sport if he thought it was involved and he said that i don't think it would be much of an edge because of all those other factors you were just talking about like so it's not as if when sports that say you're based in the u.s and yes you play on the road you just play at home but it's pretty much games are either this time this time that time and it's on set days Whereas when we speak about the tennis, like, yeah, for two months, you're in, you're in Europe playing on clay, right? Then you go yeah. to grass, then you go to the US in the summer on the hard courts. Then you go to Asia before you go prepare. Like, it, there's just so many factors that I don't know if that would be, I don't know, it's kind of like off topic, but I thought it was quite interesting that in sports, when you talk about enhancing performance. Yes, you're trying to enhance the performance on the core, but all those are the factors, which kind of tie into our clients, really, when you get to know them, we tie all those factors off, off the court outside the gym mm-hmm. it's so much right that initial conversation of how did you sleep last night oh i felt i, I didn't sleep my, my kid was like you know my two month year old like cried all month uh all month all night long could be all month long as well but all night long and you're thinking okay like that program is okay there's 
PR front squats might not be the best thing today. And, you know, just, you've just described one of my clients that in a every, nutshell, wow. yeah, every single, no, like every single, I train him. That's one of the ones I trained uh, virtually and in person, but every single uh, session I, at the beginning, obviously just checking in, like, how'd you sleep? How's your body feeling? All that stuff. So every single session is like, yeah, my kid came into our bed last night and I just didn't sleep at all. So uh, no, but I, you know, he, it's important to him to train and, and that's his hour to get his, his, you know, put into himself. And so it's just constantly, you know, we have a, I have a format for him, but it's constantly modifying depending on how he slept. That's like one of the biggest things. And that's one client that I, uh, I recommend I'm like if you can take a nap a power nap in the middle of the day do it you know or like if you can take a day off to like sleep in because he's it's so hard for him to get quality sleep so uh yeah with him it's just a lot of modify or just kind of like seeing how how every single session is and, and adapting to it going from there no that's it's part of the, the deal of clients right adjusting to how they're feeling uh Renzo thank you so much for joining us we really want to respect your time for our listeners where can they reach out find out more about you like what platforms are you available on uh I am not the best at social media so I can only handle one at a time and right now it's Instagram and it's at coach underscore Renz or uh my website is coachrenzlp.com those are really the main two to uh yeah to platforms nice cool. thank you we'll, put, we'll pop those in on the when we drop your uh your episode so thank you so much for joining us man this has been an absolute blast thank you for having me and i'm excited to see where you guys uh where you guys take this and i uh definitely looking forward to maybe uh you know being a guest in the future once, once yeah. we're all in different places funny you say that we do want to come to the west coast and do yeah. a little trainer feed tour so whenever this nonsense is they're yeah. laughing. We're dead serious about doing a tour. We're going to do a perform better when that Train stuff goes running again. Training feet tour. We're going out west. No, and reach we'll... out. And if I'm ever in New York, I'll also reach out. Yeah, hundred percent, man. We want to do some of these in person. So if you're ever in New York, hopefully we're doing person. That'd be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Cool, man. Thank you. Thank so you, brother, man. Take care, man. Talk to you soon. Right. Bye, Thanks, brother. Bye. Cool. Great episode. That was awesome. So we'll wrap it up here. Um, guys, it's been good. And we'll catch you in the next one. Stay cool, cool guys. Peace.